go away. Hello, everybody. And I just want to welcome you and thank you so much for tuning in. We are here on this lovely Friday night with Caitlin Hamilton Summy, who is a phenomenal publicist who lives outside of Asheville. And we also have Carol Bumpus, who wrote the second book in her series. If you want to take a trip to France and if you want to be surrounded by local food in France and family stories and you want to laugh and you want to just get to know real people, this is the book for you right now because we can't go to France. So bonsoir. Here's some champagne toast for you. And Caitlin, take it away. I will. I It's my pleasure to introduce you guys to Carol Bumpus. Um, in my whole career, um, it's usually the editor who has conversations with an author in an event like this. If it's a panel or a radio interview, they always bring in the editor. So it, I'm thrilled to be able to, to do this as a publicist because we are um, as intimately involved in a book as an editor is. We just work a different side of it. So I'm thrilled to be in conversation with Carol Bumpus and I want to tell you a little bit about her right now. A retired family therapist, Carol Bumpus began writing about food and travel when she stumbled upon the amazing stories of women and war in France. She has traveled extensively throughout France and Italy, and she has interviewed more than 75 families in their homes for her food and travel blogs. She published an historical novel in 2015 with She Writes Press called A Cup of Redemption. And then the following year with the same press, published a really unique, very special volume, a companion cookbook called Recipes for Redemption, a companion cookbook to a cup of redemption. She's an active member of the California Writers Club. She is an active member of the Women's National Book Association, and she lives in the Bay Area where she does public speaking, she teaches writing classes, and um, she continues to write about women, food, and war. Tonight, we are speaking about Carol's series, Savoring the Old Ways, which is a three volume series. Each of the books is a standalone. And what that means is you don't have to have read the first to understand the second or appreciate the third. But we're gonna to focus tonight on book two. The first two books are set in France and the third called A September to Remember is due out in April, 2021, also from She Writes Press. So tonight we will be discussing Searching for Family and Traditions at the French Table, book two. Welcome, Carol. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is this is delightful. Thank you. Well, it's fun because we've worked together for a couple of years and we don't really get to yes. see each other. Right. <laughs> this is what I look like, Carol. <laughs> yeah, we're on opposite coasts right we now. Are. So. We are. So in this volume, you and your very dear friend, Josiane, who originally is from France and grew up there, continue your journey in France to discover cuisine pauvre, no critiquing my accent. And, and that is the peasant food in France, the food that people eat at their own tables, not that's served in the highfalutin restaurants in Paris. And you two travel to learn about this food, to gather recipes, please note, that all of Carol's books have recipes at the end that you can try and savor. But in addition, you guys are exploring French history. And in this volume, a really poignant thread is that you're searching for some of Josiane's family history, her personal history that was lost in the chaos of World War II. Um, but you call this sort of a culinary, culinary memoir. So tell me, what is a culinary memoir, and did you coin that term? Did you come up with that? Actually, it's a culinary travel memoir. Yes. And um, I'm not sure if I did that or not, but it fit for what I, the, the style and the genre for what I uh, write about. Um, interested in the food, but interested in the food And it's mainly about the people. I want to know about all of these wonderful families, and they're eager to share these stories with me. And uh, that's, I was, the memoir is really my opportunity to share these stories that they gave to me. Mm -hmm. So that's the memoir part. Mm -hmm. You've made many friends over the years 
and I know that this isn't something we discussed talking about before the event, but you, you've been in these people's homes. And since you brought this up, that the book is in many ways about the people, you know, are you, I just want to know, are you still in touch with all 75 of these families? Or are you still in touch with a majority of them? I am in touch with a number of them, mainly from France because I stayed, it's been more recent that I've been in contact with them. Some of these stories um, have been written from almost 20 years ago and I'm in contact, but some of these other, the, the newer ones, um, they're on my Facebook. Yes, I'm in contact with them. They know what we're doing right now, so. <laughs> oh my gosh, well, I, we, we better do a good job then. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's always what I was feeling. I need to go, do a good job for them. So Yes, I mean, that makes sense. These people have invited you into their homes. They've shared personal history. They've shared recipes. Right. Tell me and tell all of us, what is peasant cuisine and how is it, in fact, different from what we might find in a Parisian restaurant? Well, one of the things, how this all started out, and let me just backtrack just a moment, because I traveled with my dear friend Josiane, and it was through Josiane and her mother, Marcel, that were going to teach me about French food, how to cook uh, French food here in my California kitchen. And um, they offered to take me to France with them. And of course, that was a wonderful opportunity. And I asked, yes, I was wanting to learn the haute cuisine. And they said, oh, no, no, we don't do the high cuisine like you just described. And but we do more of the peasant cooking, the cuisine pauvre. And um, what that is, is really it leads me into um, where I was going into the traditional foods. These are the traditional uh, recipes that were handed down through all the many generations. And so it's not just traditional to um, that family, but it's traditional to the region of France or, or Italy and um, all of these. And so it really speaks to place. It speaks to history. It speaks to what's available, what's seasonal, and um, mainly economical. And so this is what normal people you know, cook with. And so when I was bringing forth these recipes, I wanted recipes that were not going to be so complicated, some are, but uh, not so complicated that the normal at home cook um, couldn't, uh, you know, dive in there and try it. So uh, that was my goal. And I consider myself kind of a normal, average cook. I, I'm not a chef. I don't plan to be. That's not my goal. And um, in fact, I sometimes bristle a little bit when people consider this a cookbook because it's really, it's a family stories. Oh, and there's some recipes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, did I answer that question? <laughs> oh, I think you answered it beautifully. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> did, do you have a favorite recipe? And I know you you have a great story I'd love you to share about how you tested the recipes for this book in the age of COVID. Because oh, your, you. your production schedule coincided with the rise of, of the pandemic. Right. But I mean, first, do you have a favorite recipe from this volume that's in the volume that readers could try? And then can you share how you how you tested all these? Because it's fabulous. Okay. Well, straight In this particular book is a Moroccan uh, chicken stew, which doesn't sound like it's French whatsoever. But that is the whole point of this book is that the influences that came into France come from all of their territories and from all of their different regions. And the couscous and some of these wonderful flavors are part of and parcel of that uh, that popped up and I think people enjoyed that the most in in COVID it was I think um, I think it was the 14th or 15th of, of um, March 
And it dawned on me that people were going to be shut down or that I was going to be shut down and I wasn't going to be able to go out and get the kinds of ingredients ingredients I needed for all of the to test all of these different recipes. And some of them are a little obtained in some areas and not I went, I, I put put it out on my newsletter that if people were interested in helping me out, they could help me do the testing. Well, and of the 19, I sent out over 85 recipes all over the country, all in, also into France and also into England. So it, it just went all over the place. And people just had the most fun with it. And I did too, because I was getting emails back and forth from these folks all the time saying, this is what worked. This, uh, here's a picture of what, what, is this what it's supposed to look like? <laughs> you know, so, And it was just delightful. I have to say, you know, when you're, when you're um, supposedly closed down, I was more connected than I'd ever been before. And it was such fun. And so each month then I would publish in my newsletter the pictures and the, the foods of the people that had sent me in the recipes of that time. And in fact, all of the people that participated, their names are in the back of this very book, this book, um, the book two. So they were a lifesaver and it was it was just a delight, just a delight. I think, I think it's a beautiful story for this Thank time. You. You know, um, one of the things that has always intrigued me about working with you and the books that you write is that you are a retired family therapist. And so much of this book, as we're discussing, is about family, family tradition, you know, food traditions. But all of these illuminate people. Ultimately, right. the book is about people. What do you or what do you think French you've learned from French families that American families need to know? Well, I think that I think that was really that's a good question because it's probably the question that I started out my series asking when I would go and interview people. Uh, partly, I was wanting to know what holds families together. Big, big issue um, that is shared widely. I just asked them what foods brought you to the table? What foods did you serve as a child, you know, when you were, um, that were served by your mother to you when you were growing up? Do you still share those with your family? Do you still bring families together um, in that way? And that was really kind of guiding me into um, understanding the culture of the French and the Italian, which you'll see tomorrow or next year. But um, the other part was um, that it, it opened up doors to the history. Mm -hmm. And that was where I was led into the World War II aspect of it, because mm -hmm. a lot of people would talk about the fact that, well, we didn't have much. So this is what we would prepare. We didn't have enough food to put on the table. It was during World War II. And so that led me into delving in further into the history and has sent led, led me to, um, and that's why I wrote the historical novel uh, based on Marcel's life because she was born um, in um, France on the eve of World War I ending and then she died just right after 9-11. But she went through and experienced the impact of a number of different wars in her lifetime. And that impacted what kinds of foods they had, what was available to them, how they could protect their families, how they uh, would come together. And that was the important point, that food was the glue mm -hmm. that brought families together and held the traditions together. And that's what they hold on to most of all. And that was the that was what I was trying to find out. What is it that brings you to the table and what holds you as a family together? And I think because the people in Europe suffer 
which has been handed down through the next generation to the point that everyone understands the importance of, of having family because they have lost so many members of their family and or they had um, not been able to find enough food to eat. And so, and the thing about starvation, and that's really what they faced, many of them faced, is that that is a feeling and an expression that actually collapses time. You talk about that to someone in the their 80s or 90s about what was it like back during World War II, and immediately they almost grab their stomach and they are there. They are there. They're almost physically back in that age because it was such a um, important uh, experience of almost dying, almost not, not making it. And so all of these things, it sounds like it's, it is complex, but it all fed into why I was doing these interviews in the first place. Well, it's a weave. And I think when people read the book, they'll see the weave. I mean, when you sit at a table with someone and you're share and, and you're and you're sharing food um, and wine and laughing, but you ask questions that that bring up memories, um, you do you do get into the personal history and then the broader mm -hmm. history and then some of the larger questions about what holds families together. I find it very interesting, you know, because so many moms I know are feeding kids mac and cheese in the back seat or had been prior to COVID, mm -hmm. taking one to football and trying to feed the other one a bottle. You know, it's, it's just different now. And it was, I think it's rarer now for families in my experience to have time to sit down together. Um, so it was wonderful to see families really able to prioritize that. And I'm, I'm just speaking in general realities. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are many families here who prioritize it. Um, but it does seem that many of us struggle with that, with the pace of life prior to well, the pandemic. Was to force us back to the table here. Mm -hmm. And it was a matter of trying to um, get... <laughs> um, it's a matter of bringing families to the table in a way here in this country and, and actually throughout the world because you couldn't go anywhere. You were a captive audience. And so it was no different than during wartime in, in some ways because you were forced to be in the same space and you appreciate you know, each other in a way. And one of the times I actually um, I was talking to a... And uh, they were talking about, I said, you know, I see you have um, young uh, teenagers or teenagers that are actually in college age and they're, they're still here. They're not at, off at college. Um, that kind of surprises me. Why is it that, you know, they're still living here and uh, choose to live here? And they said it was during a crisis, a financial crisis, a number of years back and they had no choice but to bring their their sons and daughters back home because the cost of of um, school was too much and they realized in that process that they really preferred to be together so then they made their life choices about those students those young kids were able to go to colleges that were close by but they would come home at night and it was a big moment in, in my understanding of what is important, how important is family. It is absolutely mm -hmm. very different than what we experience here, but it's not that we can't. Right, right. Well, one of the things I, I find really interesting is that um, Josie Ann helped you to meet families and friends. Right. And so you were able, with her aid, to go into these people's homes and speak with them, sort of, she was sort of introducing you, you know, um, which again speaks to the power of personal connection and family and dear friends. But how hard was it? I mean, I think it's hard to meet anybody new in, in a professional setting or in a classroom. You were walking into people's homes to eat with them and take and notes stay with them. them. Yeah. 
yeah. and stay with them. Yeah. What, yeah. Talk about that. I mean, it took a lot of courage, but did you just roll with it? Was it just, I mean, well, they it was, didn't they? it was, a, <laughs> you have to know Josiane, you know, this is, she is a gift. And Josie, everyone loves Josiane because when she enters a room, the room is, it's, it's just lighted, you know, mm -hmm. it's all a light and everyone loves having her to come visit. So we stayed at her friend's homes in France mm -hmm. and her, uh, her relatives, her brothers, um, and, at, you know, and their nephews. So we were at homes that she was familiar with. They were very familiar with her. This is um, their auntie that had come. And so it was, um, it was delightful because they just adore her. And they would do anything that she would say, you know, because they love being in her. But it was, it was also experience. It was celebratory too. When I said earlier, they gave you champagne, didn't they? They did. I mean, so many of these yes. people, it was almost like a celebration when you two walked in Every. the door. It, and it, it wasn't, would you like a glass of wine? Everybody was giving you champagne. There was such joy. So you were uniformly happily welcomed, which I think would, would make it easier, but it still took a lot of courage. I mean, you know, did you go in prepared with questions? Um, to some degree, um, I think one of the things that was the most difficult is that I don't speak um, fluent French. So, uh, and many of the people that I stayed with, um, they didn't speak English. So it was really up to Josie Ann. She was kind of the, the uh, impresario we would just uh, make sure that everyone knew why I was coming. I was called a journalist and I would be coming. And at that point I had never written, you know, anything. So I had to pretend like I was going to be a journalist <laughs> and I was the least of them of that for sure. And, but um, they, they knew that I was coming to ask about their favorite foods and their traditions and they would be ready they would be ready with they would have all these cookbooks all these things lined up and oh they couldn't wait to show me this and and teach me different classes you know cooking classes there in fact the very first cooking class I took over there was um, to make Italian pasta and I thought well how is this possible that I'm coming to learn French food when you're teaching me well and then the stories roll out. It is just, it's the most beautiful story about the connection of people to where they in a um, uh, iron ore mining community way up in Northern France. And that particular community had drawn uh, after World War II, people to, for work from all over Europe that people were looking for work. So you had Polish, you had Italian, you had um, uh, people from Morocco. That's that's where some of this came from and from all over. And so the children that grew up in those communities didn't realize until they left when they grew up that all the foods that they were tasting of the neighborhood, they thought they were all French foods. They assumed they were all French foods. They're in France, why wouldn't it be French? And so it, but it was the Italian neighbors that taught uh, my, my friends how to make pasta and that they loved it. They loved it so much that they, um, and I learned it from her cousin and I learned another recipe from her brother. Mm -hmm. And so, and they were totally different, but they lived on the same, you know, within two, two houses from each other and they knew what they loved. And that was part of the story. And so I learned uh, to make their favorite foods because that's what they serve to their children, their grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren. Well, I think that I should open it up because I, I could go on. I have tons more questions and I've worked on all the books. So um, I'm familiar with them, but I still have questions. But let me open it up because I'm sure other people would like to ask 
ask you some things. Okay. Um, does anybody have a question that they'd like to type into the comments section? You ask questions in the chat, says Sue from page 158 books. Okay, I can see um, Leslie Knack is here and she's from San Diego area. And she and her husband actually had me come down to their home and they cooked um, for I think 65 people uh, mm -hmm. some of the recipes from my uh, first cookbook. And so I'm, I love that she's on and that's wonderful. Could you do this by yourself? Um, could Sue, I do, can I do ask the questions? Is that it? No, I think Sue, do you mean could Carol travel by herself? Oh. I think that, yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's the answer, Sue, no. No, um, simply because of the fact that um, I don't speak the language, you know, fluently. I, I could maybe um, put out a question, but I would not know the ramifications of the answers that were given to me or even how to follow up on that. And so what I did was um, before was I had a tape recorder and taped everything. And so then sometimes, you know, and Josiane would ask the question and then she would give me the answer and um, back and forth, back and forth. But it was all through Josiane that through her translations that I was able to do it. So could I do this on my own? Not in the same way. Now I did travel through parts of Italy and I, but I was always traveling with people that were able to speak the language. And so, or they spoke that people we were with spoke enough English that it was not a problem. And so if I traveled again, I would travel with people that could could help me with that. And it's just it's it's an amazing um, experiment because people love to talk about their favorite foods. So it just opens up, you know, just just automatically people are there for you. So Leslie was asking if, if you could share a little bit about the regions of France in which you and Josiane traveled and the different kinds of foods. Maybe you can speak a little bit about right. some of the different right. regions, specialties. Well, so the, in the first book of this series, I started out, we started out in Paris and we went into the Champagne region. That's why we have the Champagne with us <laughs> right here. And uh, that's, uh, so I traveled into the Champagne region. And then from there, we went into the Alsace, which is the far Northeast corner of France. Then we traveled back through the Lorraine and ended up in Paris once once more. So in all those regions, because they're northern regions of France, their foods are very specific to um, place and climate. So you have more cheeses, you have more milk products, you have butters and, and sauces that are that type of thing. So that's what would uh, speak to you eat what's available. And it's just no different than here in this country. In Minnesota, you have, or Wisconsin, you have cheeses, you have, you know, but down south, like in Provence, if we went to Provence, then it would be olive oils and um, all other types of, uh, you know, a different type of fresh fish than you would have up in the north. Um, and so it's, it all speaks to the region, the, and sometimes the language. So in, uh, for instance, in the Alsace, there were very Germanic influenced um, foods. And some of my most dramatic stories that I heard came from there because it had been taken over completely by the Germans during World War II. And, but the foods are, you know, they love to share those because that's what they know. And they're wonderful, rich foods and um, all kinds of sausages and schnitzel and, and uh, tart flambe, which is kind of like a, uh, a type of pizza almost, except it's with cream and onions and bacon on the top instead of, of um, tomato sauce or something. So then you go to uh, different regions down in the South again, or in the Auvergne, which is in the second book. The second book starts right 
in Paris and we head north into Nord Pas de Calais. And that's where, again, we're back into the, um, the Flemish. This is a region that is influenced by uh, the Dutch. And um, so you have that style of food, that wonderful beer, that wonderful, you know, all of these different kinds of foods. And then we headed um, to the west going into Normandy wonderful ciders, apple ciders. This is a, a oh. wonderful time of year because apple cider is in all of the different chicken dishes. It's in the all kinds of, um, of the seafood. So you have all of these wonderful, wonderful, flavorful things. And uh, one of my favorite dishes was um, mules, which is uh, yes. mussels, yes. and they're steamed with um, either wine or cider and cream. Mm -hmm. And and it's just delectable, just wonderful. But you have to love and have to be willing to try all kinds of foods. Right. And, and sometimes I was challenged, you know, sometimes it was challenging um, because I didn't know what on earth I was eating, but I was always willing to try it. And that's, I think, one of the things that if you're going to travel, if willing, be willing to open that door to trying something new because it's it it just throws the doors open to all kinds of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's also it's also polite, isn't it? I mean, you want yes. to experience part of someone else's culture, then you need to be open to experiencing all yes. kinds of different foods and, and being open to hearing what the culture is. Um, Sue has a couple more questions. She says, um, two, I guess to sum it up, two questions. Did you find anything in France that has surpri had surprised you? Because we all have an image of what France is. And being a therapist, did you ever just sit back and watch people and, and just sort of ruminate about about them, um, that they were, but where you were watching them as in sort of a therapist way ever, I guess. I, you know, um, I think people assume that I would be doing that, but I forgot to do that. I just completely forgot. I just really love being around people and I love hearing their stories and I get so engrossed in their stories that there isn't any, um, analysis that is going on. Um, I is that when you're introduced into a family um, or introduced to some dear friends of someone, um, you're immediately embraced. There was never a hesitancy or a disregard for who I was. It was an immediate embrace. And so that's very different than most people experience when they go to France. Um, if they don't if they're not traveling with someone that, you know, that knows the language and knows the people. And so that, that's quite different. And I think that is probably the gift that I was given. Uh, mm -hmm. Being met and with open just arms. genuine affection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? If not, let me, let me ask, let me ask um one or two more um i know right now we can't really travel so the joy of your books aside from just that they're wonderful is that we really do get to get away at a time we couldn't otherwise when we can travel again are you guys going to go back or is this it are these three books um, the oh no um in fact we were supposed to go back last summer um we were going to spend um two weeks in the south of france and um, about four days in Paris. So I, we still plan to go back. We'll just, just wait. But it's been really interesting with these books. It's opened up more doors to me. And So you're going to meet more families? And so I'll go back, definitely. I'm sorry, I missed what you said. When you go back then, will you be just visiting or are you gonna continue the series and meet more families? Um, I don't know. You know, I really just plan to go and just enjoy myself. But really what happens is that I end up 
when I'm traveling with my husband, we meet all kinds of people and the stories, I still have plenty of stories I haven't told yet. Um, yeah. Certainly in the south of France, because that's where we normally would stories from there. And I just would go with people or go Sue wants to, so, Sue, I don't, can you see the comments? Sue would like to travel with you when you go. <laughs> okay. We'll make a date. We'll make a date. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie as she well. Says, she says she's cheap. <laughs> yes, there we, there we go. And Leslie wants to go too. Okay. All right. We'll I make think, a whole group. We'll I do that. You might, you might turn into a tour guide because I'd like to go too. <laughs> Well, a actually, literary tour. yeah, I, I started out by traveling with a woman who was a, a, a cooking instructor here in the Bay Area, and I would travel with her to put together a cook. He started going, and then I wanted to know more in depth what the family stories were. So, but it's always been about food, but it's mostly about the families. I mean, food is the avenue to meeting the families, isn't it? It's the door that that you open. I mean, you couldn't just go into someone's house and sit down necessarily. I mean, I suppose you could, but it would be harder perhaps just to sit and interview them, you know? I think talking about the food is a lovely way to share time with people and get to know people. And it seems a natural conduit to mm -hmm. a larger mm -hmm. story. Well, and it's, I think it, you go with what flows the easiest. Sometimes you're not just sitting there at the, at the table with them. Uh, you'll find in the stories that I'm writing, markets and learning all kinds of things about, oh my gosh, I didn't know there were 3,000 different kinds. Always wanting to learn more. So, that's what it is. It's a literary tour. It's a culinary tour. It is a uh, travel. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about the travel. For Focusing on the people. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the travel for a minute because there were, were, were times when you would step away from meeting people and, and you would go to Mont Saint-Michel or you would go see the sites. Mm -hmm. How was that important? Why was that important? to sort of round out your story, to see the tourist sites? Well, because I, um, first of all, I was always following the story about war. And Mont Saint-Michel, it was a fortress, um, you know, that has been there for, you know, a thousand years or more. And um, and some of the places that were near there had been some of the, the well, the, the um, the Normandy beaches aren't terribly far from there. Um, so I was kind of checking into what was it like to live and survive during war? And I was always wanting to know what was life like back then? What was life like and what did they eat and what? And so it was really um, trying to understand We have war all the time. We have war and people survive it, obviously. But how? How do they survive it? And because uh, Marcel was the one that introduced this to me in the first place, um, and it was just a fluke, I, I asked her, so what kinds of foods did you serve your family as a young wife? And she threw her head back and laughed and said, well, we didn't have to diet, that's for sure. And she said, we were in hiding. In fact, I think they were living in a, a, a cave during World War II because uh, her husband at that point was in the Maquis, which is like a French resistance fighter. And they were in hiding. They were lucky to have a potato or two. And so when she said that, that statement changed my life. That mm -hmm. statement told me that there are ways of raising your family and ways of doing the best you can for your, your family. And uh, I have no 
idea what that's like to live with war on my soul, on the um, front doorstep like they did. And how did they survive? This was always a question about how did they survive? How was it that women survived? And how did they take care of their families? And what did they do? So that was, you know, all of these little things were pieces and parts to the same story. It's the mm -hmm. history, it's understanding um, the, the drama that women have to go through because women are, um, especially when it comes to wartime, we're considered just collateral damage. They don't even count the number of people that are impacted. They count the soldiers that are killed, but they don't consider the people. And so I was wanting to give voice to the people. What is their story? What is it? And uh, in fact, that took me back to uh, France with Josie Ann. She took me back there and we traveled twice to for World War II veterans um, uh, um, tours. And I was able to ask the questions of these veterans, in of the US veterans and also the French veterans. What was life like then? And that was part and parcel of that led into my book, uh, my historical novel. And so it was understanding that. And oh, by the way, what kinds of foods did you serve and what do you serve now? Well, they were giving us more wine than we had any right to. And um, we tra I traveled with them for 10 days each time. And there might be 60 people on a bus and maybe Nine of them were the the old veterans and they're telling their stories as we're going up through the route. And we're going through the route of, of the where they uh, brought freedom to those villages. That very same freedom trail. Everywhere we stopped, 40 villages, there were all kinds of festivals, all kinds of parades, all kinds of ways of saying to our soldiers, our U.S. soldiers, Thank you. Yes, it's been 65, 70, 75 years now. It's 77, I think, years since they were there. And they still celebrate our the liberation that was brought to them. They still celebrate that. Even the preschoolers are out there with their little um, red, white, and blue um, American flags because they were taught their history. They were taught this. This is something we don't do here. We don't understand. We don't appreciate our vets. And that's what they would say. That is their motto throughout France. You will hear, we will never forget the gift you gave us of liberty. We will never forget. So then, um, obviously, And they are very um, lovely, lovely, lovely people. And I was, I was very fortunate. Uh, just a reminder for for people listening that Marcel is Josiane's mother, and she wasn't able to make the trip uh, that they originally planned. Although Carol and Josiane went twice, Marcel unfortunately passed before the first trip. So her spirit is one of inspiration for the books. I see Sue appearing so sadly. I think we have to end our conversation, Carol. And I pass no, everything back. Well, to not Sue. yet, because I just oh, wanna, okay. I just wanna sit around and just chat with you all night. Put my feet up, get a blanket and a cup of tea. Um, there is a buy the the book here and that green button, so that'll directly um, get you to buy the book. You have a new book coming out in April, which right. I'm yes, so yes, excited yes, for that. Yes, um, you have your first that. book and your second book about France and then Italy. We all need this right now because there's laughs in it. There's food. There's everything we all need. Instead of a hug or traveling, we can have your book. And I really appreciate you being here. I can't wait to have you back out and talk about Italy. And I really, <laughs> really, you. really want to go to France. And I'm hungry as heck right now. <laughs> so thank you. Um, You're welcome. And Caitlin, thank you so much for offering your time and your generosity you. with this wonderful author I would never have heard of. That's what the best thing about being in the book world is the sharing and the compadre. So thank you both. And thank we're going to put this back up on our YouTube channel. So it's going to be page 158 books. 
in a few days, Dave's going to get the, I don't know what he does, but <laughs> um, some yeah. IT stuff. I don't know. Um, so Carol, I wish you well in California. Thank you so much. You have the whole night ahead of you. Caitlin, you and I are probably hitting the sack because we're old. No. <laughs> it's been a long week. Thank you all so much. Yes. And the book is for sale. We have access to the post office and treat yourself. Don't be shelfish. Get a book. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Have a great night. Thank Bonsoir. you very much. Bonsoir. Thank you for having me.